name is Charlene Margo, and I'm the founder of the Parent Education Series and co-founder of new nonprofit, The Parent Venture. We could not be more delighted to welcome you all this evening to Mental Health 101, When Should Parents Worry? We know that this topic is incredibly important to the community. Um, with more than 800 registrants, we really have seen how important this topic is, and we are thrilled and grateful for tonight's speakers, Dr. Shashank Joshi, Dr. Amy Hedigan, and April Torres from San Mateo Union High School District. So before I tell you a little bit more about our presenters, let me first of all welcome you again to this event and a few thank yous. This program tonight is sponsored by Peninsula Healthcare District, who is our new partner. Very, very big thank you. Shout out to Ashley McDevitt, the Community Engagement Director for Peninsula Healthcare District. Thank you. We would not be here tonight without you. Um, again, I'd also like to thank our presenters who are here generously with us this evening. So let me tell you a little bit about how tonight is going to run. For the first 30 minutes or so, Dr. Joshi will be speaking to you directly, followed by Dr. Hennigan and then April Torres. I will then return for some questions from the audience. Tonight, we would like you to use the chat button for any comments that you may have, either for us or one another. My partner, Bev Hartman, will be working in the chat box. She'll be posting resources and later on in the evening, a very short survey that we hope you will complete. For questions, we would like you to put your questions into the Q&A box. Oh, and I should start by saying that if you need Spanish interpretation, we have a wonderful interpreter with us tonight, Cynthia Hinesterosa. So if you need Spanish, please look at the bottom of your Zoom screen for the interpretation globe and click on Spanish. If you need Spanish interpretation, the globe icon, click on Spanish. This event is being video recorded and will be available for free in our video library. With more than 11,000 views, we know that the video library is an important resource and this program will be added to that YouTube channel. Okay, let's get started. Let me tell you a little bit about tonight's presenters. Dr. Shashank Joshi is Professor and Director of Training in Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and Director of School Mental Health at Stanford University. As both a pediatrician and a psychiatrist, he is the recipient of numerous awards in teaching, mentoring, and public service. Dr. Joshi's publications focus on interprofessional collaboration, cultural aspects of pediatric health, well-being promotion in youth and young adults, and suicide prevention in school settings. He is the lead author of the K-12 Toolkit for Mental Health Promotion and Suicide Prevention used by the California Department of Education and co-editor of the recent book, Partnerships for Mental Health, a guide to community and academic collaboration. His current book project is an international collaboration entitled Thinking About Prescribing, the Psychology of Psychopharmacology with Diverse Youth and Families, which examines the relational and psychotherapeutic aspects of medication treatment. Next up, Dr. Amy Hennigan joined Palo Alto Medical Foundation as a pediatrician in 2007. She now has a thriving panel of pediatric patients in the Palo Alto Department of Pediatrics. Dr. Hennigan serves on the Professional Affairs Committee, PAC, including eight years as a member and three years as chair of the Palo Alto Division, PAC, the Executive Committee of the Adolescent Behavioral Health Project and the Concussion Task Force. Dr. Hennigan has helped launch programs for teen yoga and mindfulness at PAMP, and she is a member of the Herd Alliance. Her research interests include adolescent mental health and community efforts to prevent teen depression and suicide. And finally, last but not least, April Torres is the manager of mental health services with the San Mateo Union High School District. April has worked in education for the past 22 years, 15 of them with SMU HSD. She is a strong advocate for student equity and mental health and uses her background in education, administration, and her license in marriage and family therapy to support these efforts. Please join me in a very warm welcome for our panelists, Dr. Joshi, Dr. Hennigan, and April Torres. Thank you, take it away. See you soon. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, special shout out to Ashley McDevitt, who is on 
our uh, screen here. You don't see her, but you see her name. She is someone who is the great convener uh, in San Mateo County and uh, along with people like uh, the Honorable Jackie Spear and uh, other folks who've been doing this work for a long time. Uh, Dr. Kevin Skelly, who's in the audience today. Um, you know, this work that we're going to talk about is village work. We're going to talk about mental health and well being. And we're also going to talk a little bit about in these strange times we live in, you know, we've got this new normal. What's normal? What's not? How do I know when to worry? And so for the next hour or so, my uh, panelists, guests, and I are going to be taking you through some of our experiences. We're going to highlight some of the science, but we're going to keep it very practical. And we're going to leave enough room for some discussion at the end. And then we'll be sharing the slides um, with Charlene so that she can make them available to you all. So with that, I'm going to hope. And then I think um, the housekeeping they will discuss with you at the end in terms of um, I think for now, they'd like you to put the questions in the Q&A and not in the chat. That way it's the easiest for people who are kind of watching over that Q&A to give us some questions, group them together around themes. So hopefully we can address as many of your questions and concerns as possible. So now I'm gonna do this magic thing we do in Zoom, which is share my screen. And so I'm gonna hope that that works and um, all right, y también quiero decir bienvenidos a todas las um, parientes y del mundo hispano. It's really nice to have a diverse crowd here today. We do have um, interpretation available and um, we are going to start now. Can you all see my screen? April, Amy, I'm good? All right. Yes. Yes. So, um, this is Mental Health 101, When Should Parents Worry? I'm gonna first start by a little disclaimer. Um, my wife, Mala and I, we are parents. I've been a Little League coach for 11 years. Of course, we didn't have Little League this past year. And um, I'm a, I'm a uh, faculty member for more than 20 years. So this perspective comes not only from what I've studied, but from what I've lived as a parent and from what I've learned as a community member. And um, so I'm hoping that I will be able to share some things that I think you're gonna know already a lot about, but I'm hoping that there might be something new in here for you that could be interesting. And um, we're eager to learn from you all as well. And so the first thing I'm gonna state the obvious that this pandemic has caused a very large disruption of education. In fact, the largest disruption in history. And by mid-April, a few months ago, more than 90% of learners were affected um, with you know, almost 1.6 billion children affected from pre-primary to higher education in over 200 countries. And this comes from a United Nations policy brief. And um, obviously the things that we are seeing and living as parents and community members, interrupted learning, confusion and distress for teachers. We as parents feeling unprepared for distance and homeschooling, having to balance the usual amount of life balance between home and work and our own personal and family well-being and really all of these challenges around distance learning gaps in child care nutrition challenges and even increases in um, at risk for at-risk populations uh, for things like domestic violence and child abuse <clears throat> of course we on the um, lucille packard children's side have been fairly fortunate there was a lot of planning that went on um, we have an amazing uh, health officer, um, Dr. Sarah Cody in Santa Clara County. I know in, in San Mateo and other counties in the Bay Area, we have a really responsible group of folks looking over us. And yet, even though we've probably dodged most of the major problems that other um, states around the country have had to face, we still have had a lot of these issues, unintended strain on our healthcare systems. We in psychiatry and psychology have been busier than ever We've seen increased pressure, obviously, in school systems um, to remain open or to have some version of hybrid or find some way to make it work. There's been a lot of social isolation, and there's been a lot of challenges to kind of measure how much learning is really going on. And the latest estimates that came out right about at the beginning of the summer were predicting that even in the model we're in now with most people in distance learning, uh, even uh, children and youth with access to really good um, you know, good Wi-Fi, good hotspots, 
um, having laptops, they're still talking about a minimum of three to six months of learning loss. And for those from communities or families that don't really have good access to reliable Wi-Fi and internet and um, you know a connection, um, you're talking about six months to a year of learning loss. And so all of these adverse consequences we talk about are, are magnified, right? When you add up the different kinds of risks and items we might call you know, putting people in a disadvantaged category, um, we've got to really pay attention in particular to the kinds of additive risks. So, but not all the things that we do that really cause anxiety and worry are necessarily bad. I mean, everyone has anxiety and worry right now. That is one thing that we might relate to one another about, right? When, when you're late for something, if an assignment is late, if, if a teacher's got trouble with the Zoom, if something didn't work out, hey, it's 2020, you know? I mean, thank goodness, we're all gonna be, you know, drinking toast to the end of 2020. Um, <laughs> but too much anxiety, too much worry really can not be helpful. A little bit of anxiety can be very helpful. You know, um, for us to get ready for this talk tonight, we had several versions of this slide deck. We had a little um, mini dress rehearsal, a little chat before this started, because we all wanted to really do the best we could with this limited time we have. But if it got to be so bad that last night, um, neither April nor Amy nor I could get the usual amount of sleep because we were so nervous about this talk. Well, that's when we're getting into, okay, now it's actually getting in the way of our function. And so how do we take into account that we're all dealing with a lot in this pandemic with distance learning and all the life balance things I've already talked about. And I mentioned that our kids are coming, our clinic uh, population is coming to see us in psychiatry and psychology. Anxiety is the most common condition. Anxiety that's more than a little stress and worry all the way up to anxiety disorders. So this little cartoon down here, which was uh, shared with me by Dr. Sarah Ordaz, who is an amazing therapist in our community um, in the South Bay. Um, she's pulled a couple of pictures here. Um, you could probably all relate to this at some point in your life. We all feel this way when we're a little stressed. And then um, this little cartoon here talks about some of the physical symptoms that one might see when it's not just a little worry, but it's a lot of anxiety to the point where it is impairing our ability to actually be in virtual school, be um, able to communicate with our friends virtually. And then we have these physical symptoms like sweating, making it hard to think clearly, having rapid heart rate, rapid breathing, having a tummy ache, trembling. This is especially seen in younger kids. Younger kids, children under 12 who may not be able to put words to their emotions their body may manifest the kind of stress that they're dealing with. When we talk about generalized anxiety disorder, so more than just a little anxiety and worry that we all have right now in a pandemic, when we use this thing called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual or DSM, there is this condition called generalized anxiety disorder. And so for adults, what it looks like is a lot of anxiety and worry, so much that you're having it for more days than not, for about for six months or longer for a number of events and activities. It's very difficult to control. And at least three of the six symptoms in adults um, here on the right, but in children, you only need one. If you have one of these that is happening most of the time for at least six months, causing problems, difficult to control, you may be dealing with actually an anxiety disorder. And so this is something that you would come to see either Dr. Henniger and myself about, or a school counselor. In fact, there are a lot of frontline interventions that school counselors can do along the lines of deep breathing, along the lines of mapping out and grading your anxiety on a scale of say zero to six, and really thinking about what are the things you do have control over? What are the things you don't have control over? Let's talk about how we can come up with some strategies to deal with the worries that you have. Um, Here's Charlie Brown saying, my anxieties have anxieties. And I think for, for people who struggle with anxiety before the pandemic, for some of those folks, the anxiety has gotten worse. For others, it's gotten better. There are some kids for whom being at home learning, not having to be at school, not having to navigate all of the social nuances of you know middle school and high school, for some kids, that's actually been extraordinarily freeing. 
For others, it's been very hard because the usual sources of connection and well-being, whether it be just seeing your friends, hanging out at lunch, being able to participate in fall or spring sports, theater, chorus, band, teams, you know, extracurriculars, things that require in-person, uh, that's really taken effect. Um, these are things that we normally take for granted and they can impede things like our normal ability to bounce back with the usual everyday stressors of being a young person. Another thing we're seeing a lot of is, um, you know, the inability to be able to serve our parents as quickly as we want because we're seeing everyone virtually. So one strategy we use in pediatrics, and Dr. Hennigan can talk about this is a bit more, is we, we might recommend a book for a parent to read. We might share some ideas in primary care or in psychiatry or psychology. And then I've listed a few here. Again, you'll get a copy of these slides. Um, these are books that are written by um, psychologists or therapists based on what we know to be best practice or evidence-based principles, for example, in this case, for anxiety. So these are some of our favorites, um, some of the authors that we know and we've worked with that we've actually used um, in our clinic. Um, and um, here are, are some other books for younger kids, um, Help Your Dragon Deal With Anxiety. This, you know, helping an animal, a pet, a stuffed toy deal with the things that you're dealing with as a child is a wonderful way for a um, child to regain a sense of mastery if they're helping, for example, in this case, in Steve Herman's book, this boy is helping his, dry, his dragon deal with anxiety. Now, how about depression? <clears throat> so we know that um, depression is something that happens when it's more than a little sadness. And in adults, we see at least five of the nine symptoms I've put here. Um, in children, if it is a mood issue plus a loss of interest, we're looking at not two weeks, but one week. At one week, if we have five of these symptoms, we are worried that this might be depression. But if we have two of these symptoms, especially irritable mood and loss of interest, that's the place where we recommend someone go see either a counselor at school or go see their pediatrician so that they can actually screen for depression a little more formally. Problems with mood, problems with sleep, decreased interest, feeling worthless or inappropriately guilty, having a loss of energy, poor concentration, changes in appetite, um, having changes in your activity level and having thoughts of self-harm or even taking one's life. Now, from time to time, our teenagers may get these symptoms. Our middle schoolers are now getting these symptoms. But when you see you know, two, three, four of these, you don't have to wait for five or more. You're seeing two, three, four of these over a one to two week period of time. That is a time where we want you to worry enough to not just keep it to yourself. Talk to someone about it, reach out to a school counselor if you have a relationship there, or especially to the primary care provider um, to which you probably already have. And most importantly, your child probably has a, a trusted relationship with. So what does this look like in the classroom? Again, I put a list up here based on any of the things we might see at any time. But in, in this case, if you have two or three of these over time, difficulty following rules, completing assignments, excessive crying, withdrawing from the usual activities, distractibility, poor concentration, persistent reports of boredom. I love this one. I mean, you know, what teenager doesn't compla complain of boredom? But when it happens all the time and it's happening much more than usual, we ought to be looking for some of these other symptoms. And so when we do our teacher trainings, we use this slide as a platform for further discussion. What are you all seeing in the classroom for kids that you're worried about? <clears throat> I put this brain slide up um, because folks like Dr. Skelly taught me, hey, if you want to go to a school board and drive this home, link academic health and emotional health with overall well-being, link um, emotional health with academic outcomes, healthier brains make better students. So thank you, Dr. Skelly, from you know many years ago when we worked together in Palo Alto to your work in San Mateo Union. Um, I'm just going to highlight this one um, area of the brain. So if you're, this is the side view of a brain. So if you're looking at me actually this way and you slice my brain, this blue area here, which is the area that dopamine is responsible for, dopamine helped you get on this webinar tonight. It was a reminder in your phone or somewhere or the reminder from Charlene, hey, this thing starts at five o'clock, so you got to make arrangements. Um, it's also responsible for thing, things like 
persevering on a task and completing a task. These red pathways are for serotonin. Serotonin, you might've heard of that. That's serotonin reuptake inhibitors we use to treat depression and anxiety. So yeah, this is where mood tends to reside in the brain. But look at this, these red functions of serotonin not only are important for mood, they're also important for memory processing, for sleep, for cognition. All the important things you need as a student to be able to succeed and engage with the curriculum. So that is why we talk about mental health in schools. And that is why Amy and Becky Beacom and Linda Lamar, Mario Jackian and other folks who formed the Herd Alliance back in 2009 started to link up with school leaders like Dr. Carol Zapecki and Dr. Kevin Skelly saying, yeah, you know what? Mental health is part of overall health and children and teens have to be healthy enough to learn. And in times of COVID, you can imagine that when mental health takes a hit, it's gonna be very hard to continue to engage in learning. So finally, when we think about depression, it doesn't occur in a vacuum. We have a very diverse community here in San Mateo County. And so we talk not only about the biological contributors like family history and the neurotransmitters I just talked about briefly and other medical disorders, but also the psychological contributors. Most teenagers are pretty resilient. They can bounce back. Those who've been through really tough times who come from backgrounds of trauma often have the most to teach us about resilience. But in times of COVID, the usual ways they can cope, connecting with a friend, seeing them, going out, getting a sandwich together, going to get bubble tea, all of these things that we now have restrictions on can start to take a hit on things like our self-esteem. Our usual social connections, family and school, school is now virtual, families all together. If there was already a little stress, maybe that gets accentuated. What can families do together outside, safely, physically distanced, but socially connected with friends? We can still do that as long as we do it safely. Peers now, we have to connect with them virtually. And what is how easy is it to now connect with our friends and neighbors? Um, culture, everything now is, I want you to think about, everything has a cultural component. When we think about culture, it's not just about your race and ethnicity, it's about your values and beliefs and practices as a community, as a family, and all of these together combine to either protect us against something like anxiety and depression to buffer these stressors, or if any of these are out of balance, it can actually bring depression or anxiety on more easily. So what can we do about it? Well, there is this interaction biopsychosocial cultural. And I've just talked about some things on the glass half empty side. I'm now gonna talk about some of the glass half full aspects of our lives that I want you all to be aware of. And then I'm gonna introduce Dr. Amy Hennigan, who's gonna talk more about some of the important things to be aware of in terms of well-being and um, things like taking care of ourselves in order to take care of our community. So those of you who are of Chinese origin will recognize this symbol um, for uh, crisis. And of course, there's the saying in, in Chinese is Wei Ji, which Wei means danger or crisis, Ji means opportunity. So Wei on this side, Ji on this side. So out of crisis comes opportunity. Now in the English language, there is only one word, one meeting. But in Chinese, crisis translates to Wei Ji. Taoism always talks about things having two sides. So when there is danger, there must be opportunity present. So Chinese literature grew out of Taoist beliefs. Everything is about combining both sides. If there is a yin side, there is a yang side. Look at positive and negative always as one, always together. For example, if there were just us three tonight, but none of you, there would be no webinar, right? Without an instructor, there's no student. If there's no student, there's no instructor. So we make a whole. You all in the audience, all 455 of you and us three, we make a whole. And so the same way we need to look at this pandemic, it's been horrible. It's been a nonstop crisis. And yet there have been some things that have provided some opportunity for us to come together as families and communities. So for example, not all distance learning is bad. I shared some of that data that actually was connect, uh, collected by McKinsey, the consulting company that predicted 
all of our kids, even the most privileged, are going to have at least three to six months of learning loss. Some of our most disadvantaged will have six months to a year. But for some kids, they've actually thrived. Um, some research suggests that students retain more material while learning online compared to only eight to 10% in the classroom, depending on the classroom setting, the teacher skills, the connection, and the fit. E-learning requires less time to learn than in a traditional classroom. Students can learn at their own pace, especially when you have asynchronous learning like we had in the spring. And we have new technology that can offer creative engagement tools like the chat groups and the video meetings. I know you, you're thinking, my God, the end of 2020, I can't wait to not have another Zoom meeting. I just, a colleague of mine the other day said, can we just connect by phone? Like, I would just be so happy to talk to you without having to like, have you see me or me see you because I am so Zoom fatigued right now. Um, so there are some things about distance learning that are not all bad. Well, lo and behold, we have the six stress busting strategies. This comes from our very own Nadine Burke Harris, who was a Stanford resident back before she became a famous Surgeon General. She's California's first Surgeon General. And this is published on Governor Newsom's website, the six stress busting strategies. And I've got the, um, the website right up there, Manage Stress for Health. What's really nice about this is, I mean, these things probably seem pretty familiar to you and pretty obvious, but what she does, what Dr. Harris does is she actually takes us through and creates a little worksheet so that we can create our own stress busting plan for these six major areas that include nutrition, exercise, sleep, mindfulness, staying connected to our social supports and getting the mental health care we need in order to decrease stress hormones and improve health. Because again, mental health is part of overall health and our children and our families and our parents have to be healthy enough to parent and healthy enough to learn for our students. Here's another thing I love to highlight. Being a Stanford person my whole career, I love highlighting what other really in innovative people do like the folks at the Berkeley Greater Good Science Center. So yes, not just because of that amazing big game where they blocked the extra point and Stanford won this year, but because Berkeley is a place that is always coming up with good stuff. This is a nice link, Guide to Wellbeing During Coronavirus. And there's a wonderful article um, by this author, Brooke Anderson, um, and she poses the six daily questions for quarantine. And those of you who heard me speak at the Redwood City Collaborative, I've been highlighting Brooke Anderson's work for the last several months. What am I grateful for today? Who am I checking in on or connecting with today? So I, I'll just combine these very quickly as an example. I'm grateful to have my colleagues, April and Amy and Charlene and Ashley to help me do this talk. I mean, it's a simple, act of gratitude, but everyone kind of cleared their schedule to make room for this because we thought it was really important. And doing this work together, we've already learned quite a bit about each other's work and well-being. We've shared resources and now we're sharing them with you all. Who am I checking in and or connecting with? Well, I happen to be blessed with more than five or six people in my life, friends, aunts, uncles who are over the age of 90. So I try to check in on one of those every month. So every week I'm checking in on someone. It's a connection. It's powerful. It's wonderful. It only takes a few minutes, but it's a really neat thing to do. And you know, too often we think about people after they've departed. And this is an opportunity for me to continue to be grateful for those relationships. One of my favorites, what expectations of normal am I letting go of today? Talked a little bit about that at the very beginning. And then these three kind of go together. How am I getting outside? How am I moving my body? And what beauty am I either creating cultivating, noticing, or inviting in today. So, you know, even when it's a little crispy out, you can take your bike in the Bay Area. You can notice the, the leaves changing. You know, you might take a different route to work if you have the luxury of taking your bike. Like Dr. Skelly, who takes his bike everywhere all the time. You used to see him in Palo Alto. He'd come out on the weekend to Mitchell Park. He'd always be on his bike. He'd go to work in his bike. And he'd take different routes because that is a small measure of well-being. While your body is working well, take advantage of some of the things you can do. So these are the daily quarantine questions. They're simple, they're on our fridge, and they're a reminder of the everyday things you can do to take care of yourself. The next few slides, I just have about four more and I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Hennigan. This comes from my dear colleague, Grace Jean-Gu. She's a psychologist and she's one of the directors of well-being in the Department of Psychiatry at Stanford. 
And um, so we did a talk together. She shared some of these slides. I really like this one. This is about your battery. It's you think about your phone battery as a fully charged, resilient kind of object that you know we use all the time. Well, how do we stay resilient? We build our coping capacity. We have a lot of positive inputs here on the right. Our activities, our engagement, our positive emotions and the activities that we use to keep our moods up, but also things like engagement with important activities, mentorship, relationships, intellectual stimulation and accomplishment. All of these things can be positive inputs, can charge our battery. And we need these because there's a lot of negativity out there from what we just survived as a community with this election that's now sort of almost behind us to the stress that happens just with existing in um, times of COVID, some of the internal conflicts that are coming up with the one reminder, question number three is like, what expectations of normal am I letting go of? And the time and energy demands, which can lead to burnout. For um, folks who do work like with April Torres, the wellness coordinators, compassion fatigue. They are caring so much for others but how much are they caring for themselves? So building that coping capacity in oneself, which Dr. Hennigan's talk, gonna talk a little bit about because she's gonna teach us a nice mnemonic to remind us that we need to recharge our own battery if we're gonna care and charge others' batteries. And then your mind is your most important tool. So these are some cognitive strategies that can enhance our well being. And I put two links up here and um, I know Dr. Hennigan worked with uh, the father of positive psychology, Marty Seligman, um, several years back. But the three good things practice is a wonderful well-being practice that is science-based now. And it shows that you can have reduced burnout and depression, especially in healthcare workers. And essentially, it goes like this. Every night for about 10 minutes, you will write down three things that happened that went well that day and why they went well. So the three good things exercise is free and easy. And the science shows that if you do this every day for one to two weeks, in another six months, you will be much less likely to suffer from anxiety or depression. And I'll give you an example. So um, last year, we got my son a, I was a couple of years ago, we got my son a, a bubble tea card, a gift card. And he went out with his friend. He was really excited. He got a new bike. He wanted to ride down by himself and he wanted to use his bubble tea card. We said, sure. He came back and it was a busy work day for me. And I was working from home. He came back and he brought me a bubble tea. Like I didn't even ask for one, but he only had like $10 on that card, but he used the entire card. So he got one for him and he got one for me. It might seem like a small thing, but that was so awesome. And he got my order right. It was lychee black tea with lychee jelly and extra boba, 25% ice, no sweetness. It was amazing. And it was just a surprise. So that was one good, why? What went well and why? Well, because he loves me and because we have a close relationship, we're connected. My son was kind of knowing that's what I needed. So you do this every night, three good things. They can be very simple. What went well and why? That's gratitude practice. Self-valuation. This simply means prioritizing the things that are important. Oops, sorry, that just automatically clicked there. Prioritizing personal well-being and growth mindset, using, using every mistake as a learning opportunity. So lower self-valuation is associated with higher risk for compassion, fatigue, and burnout. Higher self-valuation, lower risk for burnout. So Self-valuation is another concept that I think is really important as we're thinking about um, self-care and well-being and getting our minds to be our most important tool. Now, this one um, that Grace put together, I love this. It's so true. We are often kinder to, our, to others than to ourselves. So allowing these feelings of, you know, I care so much about that other person, but paying attention to, well, what am I paying attention to for myself? Yes, I might've made some mistakes. I might be upset, but I'm not my feelings and my mistakes do not define me. In fact, I can learn from my mistakes and I can learn how to, I can still be someone with feelings for something or someone or a cause, but I can notice and observe the emotions, whether they be sadness or fear or anger, instead of only feeling them. So there is this 
there is this uh, technique we do in therapy where you learn cognitively, not only to feel the feels and you talk about that in therapy, but you learn to observe them. So when a feeling comes and it's really something that's not very pleasant, you can learn to say, yeah, <clears throat> there I go again. There's that thing. There's that annoying little worry or anxiety and I'm, I'm just gonna notice it and I'm gonna decide not to engage with it. And over time, what you're doing is you're engaging the prefrontal cortex. Remember on the brain slide, I showed you that dopamine. It's a very highly developed part of what makes us human, overriding the amygdala, which is the emotion center, which is important for us. But sometimes when that takes over, we're, we're not at our best. We're not making good decisions and we're not taking care of ourselves. So self-compassion. Finally, I'm just highlighting a few resources from the National Center on School Mental Health. They have a wonderful COVID-19 resource page, a page on cultural responsiveness and equity, and they do it like almost no other organization. Some other resources here, um, including at the Stanford Center for CME, we've got webinars on positive parenting during shelter in place, talking to young people about COVID and minimizing the impact of COVID on sleep. So with that, I'm going to turn it over. This is my last slide. So what are your essential ingredients for your resilience? And um, how do you keep going in these very trying times? Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my amazing, wonderful colleague, Dr. Amy Hannigan from Palo Alto Medical Foundation, who is a pediatrician role model for me and who I've known for many, many years. And I'm just delighted to welcome her to this panel today. Dr. Hannigan. Well, thank you so much, um, Shashank. And um, I want to thank everybody for um, being part of this conversation. I, um, I must say, I've been in practice for a very long time. Um, I have lived in San Mateo County for 13, for 14 years, and I've been a practicing um, pediatrician um, for almost 30. Um, I must um, start um, my part of this by congratulating all of you. You have um, endured nine months of something extraordinary that in my entire career in medicine, I never thought I would ever experience. I just wanna say, you are stronger than you think. You are more resilient than you think. You are, you are doing this for yourselves, for your children, for your community, for your schools. And I don't think we should um, forget um, that we've, we've really um, dug very deep. Um, and I have no doubt that um, you are stronger than you think and your children are stronger than you think. Now that said, I really wanted to um, focus on a little bit of what I've been seeing in practice and give you some very concrete things um, that you can do within your families. Many of these are reminders. Many of these won't feel right. You know your families best, you know your children best. And so I'd really like this to be the, you know, um, a little bit of an a la carte with what resonates with your soul, what you think will help your families be stronger and your relationships with your children and your children's um, relationships with themselves be richer. So in our practices, um, and I, I know that I'm one of hundreds of caring um, uh, pediatricians and family practitioners in our community, we are seeing about a third of our visits are um, catch-up visits from the past nine months. About a third of our visits are for mental health um, concerns only. And about a third of our visits are for checkups. And I will say that about half of the checkups, um, which is part of what we do, also contains some concern about children's well-being. Screen time and how I talk to my ch children about screen time. How do I keep connected with my children? Um, when should I worry? So I thought I would put together just six very simple um, categories and um, and I, um, uh, I, I, I hope this, again, um, uh, ha has some lessons for you. So the first is um, P. Um, I call this press joy, by the way. Um, and I, I wanna tell you that this is what I talk about in my practice all day long. 
So the first is put your own oxygen mask on first. Um, you as parents um, have, a have a very tough duty. I think taking care of your own needs and your own um, uh, um, self-care is critically important because then you can better help your children. I, I wanna say that optimism is contagious. Hope and positivity actually is contagious. And your, um, um, your stress is also contagious. So the deep breath before you engage with your, with your child, um, I think that's really important. Um, you may feel overwhelmed. All of us feel overwhelmed and that's okay. Um, I think that when you present your best self to your child, especially for those crucial conversations, when you might be really worried about them, um, it's best to really put your own oxygen mask on first. I also think you need to be the model of, um, you know, of, uh, of, of managing this great uncertain time that we're living in. Um, I say that also um, to, to model the acceptance of um, our, our stay at home orders or wearing a mask. I, I think your children look up to you. You are the standard bearers um, within your family. So taking care of yourself means you can take care of your children. The second is you got to embrace the roller coaster. Um, in my family, we check in with each other and we are every day, we're either here or here or most often somewhere in between. And sometimes we don't even need to use words. Something could happen and a person walks down the hall and they walk by and they go like this. And we know that they're, they're struggling at that moment. I, I, wanna, I wanna underscore that under uncertainty um, creates stress and there's a constant change, a constant changes um, going on all around us. And as parents, it's okay to acknowledge that and to, to really support and validate the feelings that are occurring in our children. Um, they may feel sad, they may feel really angry and frustrated. Um, and, and these are grief responses and that's okay. I think my, my tips are to listen and to respond rather than react. Um, responding means that you sort of you sort of check your own um, um, emotion, and you may um, also need to use words that um, are are going to invite um, a, a conversation. Things like "I'm noticing that," or "I'm curious about," or "It seems that," rather than "You are." in your room all the time, open the conversation. And remember that your children are gonna have the ups and the downs just as, as you are. Um, I think giving children space is critical, um, especially teenagers. Um, and I also think that um, it's okay when um, things are sort of up and down to use the words, I don't know. Um, I think that's a very valid response. Um, the things that I worry about um, are, and signs of distress are if your child um, is having um, persistent complaints of fatigue, is extremely withdrawn, is having some physical symptoms of um, abdominal pain or headaches. Um, it's interesting, we've been seeing a lot of increase in childhood tics, and one of them is sighing, where children just kind of take a deep breath unconsciously and um, that that is uh, something that you know I've seen much more frequently in my practice. Um, if any of those things um, occur, I would um, I definitely would reach out to your pediatrician, talk through um, the uh, the situation and um, and just know that that may be a sign of distress. Um, I also want to just underscore that your children, especially your teenagers, they wanna protect you. Many of them really wanna please you. So it's really hard for them to admit when they're having a hard time. And that's where keeping the dialogue open um, 
really, you know, um, letting them um, uh, feel comfortable um, responding to you or being okay with not responding to you. Um, that I think that's important. Um, the third um, is uh, managing expectations. Um, honestly, um, trying to be normal normal in what we re remember is and what we really want we all want um, it's really really challenging and frustrating so I think it's okay to let go of some things it's okay to um, a, a, the perfect example is screen time parents ask me all the time like how do I set limits and quite frankly you kind of can't it's it's I mean you can within reasons but this is how we're connecting with one another. This is how our children are learning. This is how our children are connecting with their with their friends and their peers. So that's an example of an, of, of sort of managing expectations. Um, I do think that though that clear is kind. And so setting those ground rules within your family is a really important, um, it's, it, it's an important caveat. Um, that brings me to the to the um, fourth, and that's sticking to a routine. I I have to say that I start every visit. You know, how are you eating? How are you sleeping? How are you moving? And those three are to me are non negotiable, fundamentally important um, activities in a day that not only help your physical body but also help your um, emotional and psychological well being, and. I think just a couple of quick rules, um, or or if if you will, um, guidelines. Um, one is um, just keep meals um, sort of um, a little more sacred. Snacking at the computer is really tempting. However, it's also um, really not um, such a good health habit. So eating meals together, taking breaks to eat, eat meals together, I think is a very, very uh, family healthy um, experience. I think um, sleeping is really critical. It's critical to make sure that we are um, um, keeping to a sleep routine. Uh, I, I know that this is very, very challenging to do, um, but uh, I like regular bedtimes. I do recommend blue light glasses, which block out the um, uh, the uh, sort of stimulating um, um, computer uh, uh, wavelengths, um, and they can be very helpful. And I also feel um, like getting proper exercise, outdoor exercise, helps our brain stay very, very um, centered and ready for sleep. Um, believe it or not, a decrease in exercise um, causes an increase in sleep disruption. So 30 minutes of moving, regular stretching while we're sitting at the computer, very important. Um, I also think um, it's a new year. So if you haven't put in place um, these uh, health habits and you feel like it's going to be a big ask for your children, you know, this is something you can ask as a holiday gift. This is what you want. You want them to, you know, it's, it, 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 it's sort of a, 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 an act of service with a secondary gain. Um, and you can make it a New Year's resolution for your family. Um, I'm going to get to um, um, number five now, and that's seek help. You, you are not in this alone. And this is an extraordinary time. And what I would really like you to remember is that your pediatrician is a great resource to you. Um, please do reach out. They are concerned about their, the physical, emotional, psychological, and educational health of your children. Um, and they can really help guide you. They can answer specific questions because they know you and your family. I do think that finding a therapist um, can be really overwhelming. Um, I've included in the resource slide um, to, be, to follow um, uh, a website called psychologytoday.com. And honestly, it's a searchable database and it's rich. And you can find someone in your network and in your, um, uh, in, in, you know, in your area that can help. Um, sometimes employee assistance programs um, can help, help you. And last, please reach out to school counselors. They are, 
they know your children, they care about your children, and they can also be a, a very, very significant resource, significantly helpful resource to you. So I'm gonna stop by, um, by really giving um, a definition of um, what I think of when I think of joy. I think of optimism and optimism is defined as hopefulness and confidence about the future. And honestly, we have to find our joy. Um, all the, those six questions that um, uh, Dr. Joshi put up, they're brilliant. And um, telling your family members that you love them, um, honestly, finding one thing, not just that you're grateful for, but that you're grateful to your child for is really powerful. Um, they're doing the best that they can do. And hearing a kind word that you really appreciate something about them, it goes a long way. Um, find new traditions in your family. Look, use this as the opportunity to connect and know that we are really all um, doing, um, we're doing heroic work, every single one of, of us. And you as parents, honestly, I think you have the hardest job of all. So I, I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna turn it over to April. I did include on the next two slides some valuable um, uh, resources. Uh, Shashank will just um, go forward. Um, I think the CDC website is particularly helpful. And, um, and if you have questions, I just wanna urge you again to talk to your pediatrician. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity and I'll turn it over to April. Hi, thank you so much, Amy. That was great. Every, can you hear me okay? Just make sure I'm not on mute. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to start by um, just a couple of quick thank yous. Thank you to Peninsula Healthcare District for making this happen, as well as Parent Venture. Um, Shashank mentioned Dr. Kevin Skelly, who is our superintendent at San Mateo Union High School District. I wanted to give a big thank you to him as well. Um, this is his second district as a superintendent yes, where he has rolled out uh, di district mental health um, programs. Yes, programs. So thank you to Kevin. And um, I appreciate everyone participating, everyone participating on this Zoom. Um, as Amy and Shashank said, that is, that is half of the work. Is half of the work. Um, so Shashank had uh, asked me, uh, and I, I thought about this, some, some current trends that we are um, experiencing at the school level. And um, we are a high school district that I work at, but we have um, brothers, sisters, cousins, fam family members that are at the middle and elementary schools, and we are reaching out and connecting uh, together to support uh, families as a whole. So we are seeing an uptick in um, hospitalizations due to danger or harm to self. Uh, uh, we are seeing um, an uptick in mandated safety reports. And we are seeing an uptick in parents reaching out with concerns. So promote, so, <clears throat> you know, concerns with their student, concerns with other family members. Those are some of the trends that um, that the glass is half empty, as Shashank said. But we also have our glass half full. So there are many there are many trends that are happening that are positive. So some of those trends are students are reaching out and accessing wellness support, um, both virtually, either individually or in group. And sometimes they want to have a Zoom conversation. Other times they want to have a phone conversation, either way, however they are comfortable connecting. Even with Zoom fatigue, they are reaching out. Students are asking for support in healthier lifestyles. We are having uh, students reach out to us and, and say, you know what, I think I have a problem with, um, with not managing my stress in a healthy way. Um, maybe they're vaping or using other substances and we have programs for that at the school level. And so we're able to support them in a non-judgmental way. Um, students are participating in our return to school committees. So these are committees that are comprised of 
community members, family members, uh, staff, and students. And so they are able to give their, their extremely valuable um, input. Uh, students are, are, are meeting with their clubs. So Bring Change to Mind Club, the GSA and La Raza Unida clubs. So they are connecting with uh, community members to come in and speak to their clubs. They're having movie nights um, and those are all done virtually through Netflix. Um, we have San Mateo uh, High School still doing their canned food drive. So still, still trying to keep some type of normalcy um, uh, during this time. Uh, sports are on hold right now, but we have had sports uh, pods that uh, have practiced at various times. Um, and overall, students are coming together as a community and they're, they're, they're doing this when the opportunity presents itself. So students are wanting that sense of connection. Um, this time has also afforded us an opportunity to provide a level of support for students um, through telehealth, that's either virtually or through phone, that we are hopeful and know that we can continue even after the pandemic for our students that are unable to come to school for whatever the reason. So we now have um, a, a good idea of, of what we're doing here with, the, with um, offering supports through, so, through social um, platforms, virtual platforms, as well as, as phone. So those are many of the positives. Now, uh, Amy and Shashank said so much about tips and um, uh, things that you can do as, uh, as caregivers, um, as teachers that are that are on this call and, and all community members. So some of this might sound a little repetitive um, and I know they've, they've already said uh, most of this, but I think first and foremost, I wanna say build connections and be connected. So connect with us. The school is oftentimes, we're the hub and we can support and we can lead you to other supports. So if we are not able to, to provide your to provide your need with um, food or with housing or mental health support or school support, we can help connect you to these outside resources. And um, we're, we're happy to do that. So if something's not, if something doesn't seem right or you notice be, uh, behaviors that are out of the ordinary for your student, reach out to us, reach out to a trusted provider, your primary care provider, your pediatrician, um, and just ask us. We are thought partners and we will think through this with you and come up with ideas and every situation is different. So Shashank had mentioned practicing gratitude and that's huge. And you might write down three things um, uh, for two weeks, but we have some students that would say, you know what, I'm not doing that. My parents don't do that, I'm not doing that. So maybe as a family, you each write down one thing and you put it into uh, kind of a fishbowl. And after, at the end of the week, you guys can, can take them out and read each other's or you read them during, during dinner. Um, having that time, Amy mentioned, having a time to really connect, having that space, um, hopefully, you know, during dinner time, asking, your, your children, you know, what was a rose and a thorn or a cherry in a pit uh, of your day? I used to ask uh, when my children were little, I would ask them, you know, tell me something you did uh, that made somebody else's day better. So really opening up those conversations with your children and your, all of your family members to just talk. Um, Again, just reaching out to us, we are, we, we are excellent thought partners and we're happy to do that. Um, another thing is just remi reminding yourselves that we're all figuring this out together. So opening the conversation with your child, asking them what, what uh, asking them how they're doing, what's really going on and being present to listen and support. So most of the time, what do they need from us is just to listen. And oftentimes I have two teens. 
Um, so I'm in, I'm in the boat with all of you. I've had them when they were little, middle, and now teenagers. And I will often ask when I ask them how it's going, I will stop and say, did you want me just to listen? What do you need from me right now? Just to listen? Or do you want some, you want me to give you some advice? And they'll say, mom, now they're so conditioned. They'll say, mom, I just need you to listen. So don't say anything. So I already know my role in that situation. So it takes the pressure off me and it allows them to have a moment to really be vulnerable and just express themselves. Also talking to them about some, some issues that maybe are not so comfortable and finding the right time, of course, uh, and uh, taking that deep breath before you do it. Um, maybe it's about some unsafe behaviors that you've noticed or you found something and you wanna bring up that that conversation, it's okay to do that. Um, but again, you know, being present for that and really listening and um, reminding yourself that a teenage brain is under construction and we're in a pandemic. So they got that double whammy, right? So, you know, they're not always gonna make the right, right choices. And when they don't be present, listen, guide them find out what's going on, right? Approaching the situation with curiosity and not from this punitive, tell me what you did, you're, you know, there's a consequence to that. And I'm not saying, you know, never give a consequence, but really just kind of keeping that open mind. Um, and I think we can all uh, agree that we, we can all use a little grace and grace in our lives right now. Um, also, um, showing, showing your, your child that you're also human, right? And that you make mistakes. Um, Amy said, model acceptance. So in those moments where um, maybe you, you know, didn't respond as you wanted to in a situation and you want to come back and do a redo, you know, letting them know, hey, I just, I, this is getting to me today, or I had this going on, but I'm really appreciative of our time together and I apologize. And in those vulnerable moments, you are connecting and they know that they can come to you because you as well um, are you know, not perfect and you're letting them know that mistakes don't define you, right? And that you can learn and grow from them. I often tell my teens when um, something happens and I'm in the wrong, I think I'm in the wrong pretty much all the time in their eyes, <laughs> but um, I, I'll often say, you know, I am not here to be right. I'm definitely here to get it right. And so that really kind of, we take a breath together um, and just appreciate our time together and all of our flaws. Um, and then finding time to spend together, but also finding time to, to spend alone, right? Um, oftentimes we are on top of each other a lot more than we used to be. We're seeing each other a lot more and that brings so many amazing um, opportunities, but it is also a time for us to have time to reflect, to do our own deep breathing, to maybe practice our mindfulness and our gratitude. So, you know, making sure you have that time. And lastly, what I'll say is give yourself permission to take care and be kind to yourselves. We know that if we are not good, we are not good for other people, especially our children. So I, I encourage you, I highly encourage you to, to take care of yourself and, and, and be kind and give yourself that permission. So, um, oh, Shashank, I put this up here. Thank you so much. Um, this is a resource page. Um, some of it is specific to San Mateo Union High School District. But I, I do wanna say that if you have children in elementary and middle school and high school, you know, we can help support with the entire family, not just with the student at our uh, school. So some of the resources, I just wanna point out a couple. Um, uh, is the Stanford Teen Mobile Health Ban. That is huge. So um, we, we wrote a grant, um, it's been about four or five years and Peninsula Healthcare District pays for this grant each year. And we have the Stanford Teen Mobile Health Ban come out and they support our students with, every, with everything from immunizations to um, sensitive healthcare needs 
to um, uh, playing sports and needing a physical and uh, everything in between. And right now they are also supporting with multiple COVID tests. They, they run about 50 to, to 70 COVID tests when they, when they come out. And they're actually, um, uh, the, the, the van will be here tomorrow uh, in front of San Mateo High School. So there's a link there when you get these slides um, uh, or you go onto the district website and you can make an appointment for that. And then uh, lastly is Care Solace. So Care Solace, uh, is, it is relatively new to the San Mateo Union High School um, District. And I know other um, schools are going to follow, uh, districts are going to follow suit, but it's, it is a place that you can contact. It's a concierge type service and it's 24 seven weekends, middle of the night, 24 seven support where they can assist you on finding local mental health related programs and counseling services. Amy mentioned that it is, it is difficult right now and it's stressful to try to find support for your child. Um, they also can support with other family issues, anybody in the family. So feel free to use that as a resource. Thank you for your time. I am going to pass this back to Charlene who will now um, uh, go over the Q&A. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Joshi and Dr. Hennigan and April for all your wonderful advice and your suggestions. Um, we have many wonderful questions that have been coming in from you, the parents, our audience. Some of these were addressed already, but let's just see how many we can cover in the few minutes that we have left together. Again, just wonderful advice. As April said, you know, we've been together a lot, but we need to always find something to be grateful for. And sometimes right now our kids just need us to listen. We parents want so badly to give advice, but right now often the best thing we can do is just listen. Okay, this one may be for you, Shashank. A parent asks, how can psychiatrists and therapists separate normal teen issues and pandemic issues from true anxiety and depression? Oh, I'm sorry, I have to unmute you. Uh, I don't think there there is a one answer to that, um, but I'll give you a couple of ideas and then would invite Amy or April to chime in as well. You know, anxiety and depression, as I defined it earlier and put up some criteria, it doesn't really where the excessive worry or excessive sadness came from. It just it just is. And now that we're living environmentally in these very trying times that are very unpredictable, you know, we go down to red tier and we feel like we're going to have fall sports, we're gonna to get to, you know, try out for a spring sport in the back of purple. Well, that's because people are taking care of us. They're trying to make sure that we can continue to get through this. Um, but for young people, it just feels like it's crushing because you, you get your hopes up. And then um, again, many, many of our youth can bounce back and others cannot. We don't know which young person's gonna be affected at which time. You all as parents know your kids the best. You've given values, you've given them examples, you've raised them through challenging times. And now we all have to try doing it together. So if someone is presenting with worry and anxiety, I think that is, is to be expected even more so than usual. Worries about the future, worries about, you know, well, I don't wanna get my hopes up too high because you know it might not happen. And then they, they lose a little bit of their joy. And so then, then, then we come in to, to talk about things like being present, you know, going to things you have for now. Yeah, we can't connect in person, but look, you get all this extra gaming. You know, my, our youngest son, he, he loves to on, on Friday, on Saturday morning, he's, ah, oh, I'm so sad. It's already Saturday. You know, it's already yes. Saturday morning and then uh, this time tomorrow night, I'm going to have to like get ready for school again. So oh, yeah, I know the weekend comes and goes and everything's going faster, but look, we got two whole days and you could do anything you want and let's figure out some fun stuff. Cause I want to do something fun with you. Okay. Um, it, it's kind of like we get drawn in a little more these days because we are all, you know, yes, people say we're all on this together and in, in many ways we are, but we're in different, I mean, let's be real about this. Some of us are in, you know, these giant ocean lines are in these and, and we've got storm waters that affect us a lot more than those who are in the ocean line. Um, 
but what we can do is like for our kids, we can ha- we're going through this with our kids together as families and, and we can keep the channels of communication open so that when they may not normally be likely to reach out to us. If you use some of the techniques that April and Amy talked about, they're more likely to come to us so that the normal sort of worry or sadness is actually maybe an underlying anxiety or depression. We can take some action. I'm very impressed with how all, all the pediatricians, they're still going to work. They're not anything virtually, I mean, maybe a little bit, but mostly they're in the clinic. Um, and then, you know, I know that the clinics and PAMP and, and Kaiser and all the others are, they're open and, um, and the lines are open 24 seven. Okay, thank you, Shashank. Okay, thank you, Shashank. Uh, here's a question that we're getting from lots of parents. What should we do if a child has a number of the symptoms that you've been discussing but they're resistant to seeing a therapist or going to the pediatrician. What should a parent do? We got this question for younger kids, nine, 12, and then older, even some that are still in high school, but just past 18. April, do you you wanna take that? (laughs) Yeah, um, we get that question a lot. lot. So there is, um, kids all go to school. Kids all go to school. So they have a connection with somebody at their school. And if they don't, we can make sure that uh, we find somebody that they do connect with. Oftentimes I would get kids that would um, be in my office or I'd call call out or even now I'm calling home and they say, you know, I don't talk to to therapist. I'm like, oh, okay, great. What's going on? And they start talking. And so it's building that connection with somebody, right? With and somebody, uh, it right? might be a teacher, it might be, uh, it might be a school counselor, it might be an administrator, it might be the I'm campus sorry, aide, be um, somebody that they can connect with and have a conversation. And, have a and conversation. from there, they can help guide and support to get the right or level get the of right support level. that they need. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just want thank to invite you. Amy to give a comment mm-hmm. on that because that's how we got started doing this work together. Primary care is really the frontline person in addition to the school mm-hmm. staff. Yes. Yeah, I, um, I, I wanted to make a comment to parents, comment to parents, but I'm echoing, I'm not echoing. sure why. Not we sure hear you, me. we hear you, keep talking. April, there's a little bit of reverb. It seems like we all have to mute. You might want to take off your headset. I'm not sure. We're just getting reverb. Amy, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I, um, I wanted to make a comment to parents who are, um, who are watching their um, children and observing that they um, are struggling. Um, I want to say honestly that this um, April um, mentioned building trust. And I think this is where keeping the door open is really important. Um, It may be that Um, they are feeling shame. It may be that they are really flexing their muscles of um, autonomy. They can, I'm strong, I can do this on my own. And and I do think that this is not just one conversation. This This is really multiple conversations. And using the language of, you know, I'm noticing that you're spending a lot of time in your room. I want you to know that it's perfectly okay um, to, to, you know, kind of say that you're not interested in this right now, but I do want maybe some alternatives. How, how can I help you work out some of the things that might help you feel a bit better? Um, Letting them know they're not alone, letting them know that you're walking this walk with them and Honestly, I think giving them um, the freedom to say no and just keep having the conversation. I, I face this in practice all day long, um, I, you know, and, and I honor that. I just say at this time, right now, it seems you're not interested in talking with anybody. I get that. What alternative ways can we find for you to feel better and more connected and um, more centered. Um, Because I I do think that a lot of people are very resistant to engaging in therapy. 
Um, and it doesn't mean forever. It just means right now. I think that's great advice, Dr. Hennigan. You know, we tell parents to be direct with their students. You can say, I'm seeing things in you that worry me. Can I tell you why? Yes. Or I really think it would help you to talk with somebody. I've done it and it really helped me. What do you think? How could we Absolutely. Do that? So I Absolutely. think going right to the kids, especially if they're teens, can be helpful. Mm -hmm. But yeah. that's wonderful advice. So here's a question, April. I think this one is probably specifically for you. Especially now, parents say, um, we know that we should be asking for help. We want our kid to go to the school counselor. But my child is not in a position to do that, not doing well enough to do it. We're told to have him reach out. He can't. Can a parent reach out and ask the school counselor to come to the child? Or what do you say about that? Um, yes, that's a great question. And um, we can actually uh, absolutely support with that. Um, so reach out to us. Like I said, connect with us. We are thought partners. You know your child best. So we can bounce off ideas on maybe a first step. And oftentimes um, a school counselor, or we might check in with a teacher that has a good rapport. Um, we, we might uh, pull them from their Zoom class just to do a quick check-in. We'll do, a, we'll do a, a breakout room and just just have a quick chat and let them know that we're available. Um, and then we might ask, uh, you know, do you mind if we follow up in a week or so just to do a check-in? And um, more times than not, the, the young people appreciate that. Um, so there's lots of ways for us to, to support that connection. And a lot of times the students will say, you know, I don't want to go to a doctor. I don't, not a pediatrician, but like uh, a, a real therapist. We are real therapists, but that's okay if they don't think we are. And, <laughs> you know, if, if they're comfortable with that. And um, we already kind of have some street cred because a lot of times we've talked to their, their friends and their friends will say, hey, go talk to so-and-so, they'll, they'll help you. So please reach out to us, very important. Thank you, April, great advice. So I want to be respectful of the panelist time and our attendees time. So I'm gonna to end tonight with my favorite question, which I borrow from my friend, Becky Beacom, who I know Shoshana, you know well, from Palo Alto Medical Foundation. And that is, we've talked about some really hard things today. And I know a lot of parents and kids are going through hard times right now, but what gives you hope? What gives you hope for the future? Anybody? Um, oh, I don't wanna start. Shashank, did you want to say first? You're on mute. April, why don't you start and and, and let you finish, and I'll I'll finish after you. Okay. Um, I think what gives me hope is um, our young people are resilient, and um, they are taking advantage of opportunities, and they are open, and um, that gives me hope. Thank you, April. Amy, how about you? Yes, I would say that our children are smart, they're brave, they're much stronger than we think. And honestly, at the end of the day, love always wins. Awesome. Shashank, we're going to give you the last one. Oh, I love that. Love always wins. <laughs> well, you know, bringing it back to Becky Beacom, the answers lie in the community. You know, we don't have to have we don't have to, we, we are all reading, we are all on, we're all getting all of these really interesting ideas. But at the end of the day, you all in this district and our district, I and mean, we're all in Bay Area districts, we're all in this together. And I know we say that a lot, it's such work, but it really is. And I'm, I'm inspired by the fact that, you know, this many people, 500 plus people on this. And, and the one thing I'll say about mental health is continue to carry that message forward that mental health is part of overall health and children and youth and young adults are healthy enough to learn. And so with districts like ours that are, that really have leadership that believe in this connection between mental health and overall health, that is going to get us through. And that is what has us through um, these first pretty tricky nine months. And, uh, you know, I'm very thankful for 
our county health officers in the nine Bay Area counties who really know what they're doing. Um, so. I, I'm grateful for all of that, and I do have hope that that is going to help us get through. And I'm also Very inspired by um, just how many parents came on this today, parents from all bounds, um, parents from the Latinx world. Gracias a todos los padres de la audiencia. I, I just feel like all these people now are coming in to ask us questions maybe before. And, and those of you who are thinking, well, there were 500 of us, but there are thousands of us in the street. Well, just have one conversation at a time. If you text one person about this right. one, and if the link is up, um, Charlene, at some point since they're being recorded, and then you can share that link, well, you've just made a difference in your world. And I know parents who do that. Um, I know the author Heidi Kling is um, on this right now, and she's been you know, messaging, tweeting about this. And, you know, people have a big audience like Heidi, who's a who's a well-known author. And then your audience as parents, you have your circle. So how do we get the conversation going one at a time? Let someone know about something interesting you learned about today and ask them to pass it on. Well, that is perfect advice to end with. And I want to say that we are extremely grateful to all of you. Dr. Joshi, Dr. Hennigan, April Torres, for generously being with us today. And again, parents, you heard Shashank, pass it on. This video will be produced by our friends at the Boys and Girls Club and available free on our video library, which is a YouTube channel. Again, thank you so much everybody today for a wonderful presentation. Parents and attendees, I'm sorry, we couldn't get to all your questions, but we will be sending out follow-up resources and the slides. Thank you, thank you from today's presentation. Take care, everybody, and stay well.